So I've got two, I've got a variety of muscovite and a another mineral called fuchsite that's arguably another form of muscovite just with chromium in it. Um, they are both micas. Uh, other micas include uh, lapidolite and biotite and all sorts of all sorts of micas. And they're if I say phyllosilicate, I'm referring to the micas. They're sheet silicates, okay? Yeah, musk. No, muscovite's leaving. All right, moving on slowly but surely. I'm sorry. All right, so this is this is chromite or uh, I'm sorry, fuchsite, which has chromium in it. <sighs> this is actually muscovite. Uh, and this is also another piece of muscovite. And you'll probably notice that it looks kind of silver or gray. And that's just because there's, it's it's much, much thicker. And there's, um, well, other rock there behind it. So the light is going to look different than it will through a tiny, thin piece of just muscovite. Make sense? All right. So this is um, a a phyllosilicate. So it's, again, in the in the group of silicates. So it's got silica, oxygen, potassium, and aluminum. So you're going to need a lot of aluminum and some potassium, again, in whatever system that this mineral forms in. And this mineral actually can be found anywhere. Sedimentary, metamorphic, igneous environments. It's found everywhere. It's very, very pervasive. It's one of the last minerals to cool in a body of magma. So it's surficial temperature. Um, it, it's much more stable at surficial conditions. Fuchsite. Fuchsite is a is a variety of of muscovite. Its hardness is only two point five on the cleavage surfaces, and you're I mean, there it's literally it's it, this kind of mineral has what's called basal cleavage. Again, cleavage is on the is on the atomic scale. You've got a preferential weakness in a specific direction, and in this case, you have in one direction, and it's always going to form in these little sheets, and they just stack and they stack and they stick. Sometimes they can be thick, and when you look at them on the side, they literally look like sheets in a book. So sometimes you call these booklets. Um, Kale and I can also be referred to as booklets. Um, and I'll show you some images eventually of that one because Kale and I, I think, made it. Yeah, it was Kale and I versus Cinnabar. Uh, the reason harmful Kale and I is so cool is because, well, there's a ton of information that I'm, I'm not going to go over it tonight, but I am going to go over it. And one of the things that I especially wanted to talk about it was some of my own research um and images that i have in fact i wanted to find one and tweet it the day that kale and i was there but i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do so come the next the next round when it's when it's out it's a lot it's the clays are a lot the clays are a big big group all righty all righty all righty so this is a few shy my samples actually do look like this quite a bit they're they're not they're they're very massive and and shapeless and very sparkly um and uh, you'll, I mean, I've mentioned this before, muscovite um, and fuchsite are used in, in cosmetics and other industrial things as well. Um, all right, so we've got potassium, aluminum, silica, oxygen, right? The, the, so I wanted you to focus on this formula here because each of these can be replaced. Each of the, the, the potassium and the aluminum and the silica can actually be uh, replaced. Or the, I'm sorry, the potassium, aluminum, and hydroxyl. So the potassium can be replaced, yeah, potassium can be replaced by sodium, rubidium, cesium, calcium, and barium. Aluminum can be replaced by magnesium, um, both types of iron, ferrous or ferric, uh, manganese, lithium, chromium, titanium, and vanadium. And hydroxyl can be replaced for the anions, uh, fluorine and chlorine. So this can have a lot of replacement going on. And, uh, well, probably part of the reason why it's so readily available because it can be replaced with so many different things so so easily. Um, paragonite is a is the sodium analog of muscovite. And uh, it's because of the size difference of sodium and potassium. You can only have up to 10% sodium in muscovite because of the size difference of the cations. Whereas uh, in paragonite, you can have up to 20% sodium. Make sense? So in this mineral here, you can have up to 10% of this being replaced with sodium. And in the mineral paragonite, you can have the sodium be replaced. Up to 20% of the sodium is replaced or can be with potassium. And it has to do with the size of that spot. Does that make sense? They form uh, tabular pseudohexanal hexagonal crystals. Because they're not, it's not hexagonal, but they kind of look hexagonal, which is why it's it's called that way. It's monoclinic, um, which is a different group. 
but the way that they they grow they can they can al- they almost look like little hexagons but they're not um that's why they're called pseudo hexagons um they can again be referred to as books each little sheet and if i had a bigger sample i would gladly just peel off a layer of my muscovite so you could see how very very easily peeled apart this mineral is it's only got a hardness of two or two and a half i think yeah two and a half um and it uh you can find them in in big nice clumps in like pegmatites for example um but typically they're they're like micaceous little flakes all over the place that aren't very well shaped they're just kind of a few little sheets thick maybe um not very many sheets thick kind of that that sort of thing yeah, atomic packing packing factor, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. That's why I don't go into it, Folster. People get bored of that shit, and I, and rightly so. It, all of the things when it comes to the structural and, and crystallography of minerals gets really boring really fast, and people start to tune out very quickly uh, is what I found. Although it is interesting. I like to go over just the basics of it so that people understand why, but not necessarily go into all of the details because it is extremely detailed and can be very boring. Um, at least I prefer to talk about other things in geology. Uh, trying to think. Of course, it has perfect cleavage. It's got basal cleavage. It's, it, it forms on those sheets, and each of those sheets are easily removed. All about the details. Um, it's flexible and elastic. The individual sheets are, of course, if you have m- enough of it together, it won't bend. But the individual sheets are actually flexible, um, it, which is, I think, very, very cool. The they used to use muscovite, and I think can still. Sometimes they still do on uh, uh, for windows. Um, I think there are some old. I don't know if they're furnaces or something, but they still make. Uh, little viewing windows out of muscovite. In some cases, it's not very common, but it <laughs> can still be found in some weird cases. Um, the mineral itself is vitreous, so that has to do with the light reflecting off of it. It's colorless. It can be light green, red, or brown. I've never seen red or brown varieties, but it can be. Um, it, again, has a white streak. I can't actually show you that. I don't have a big enough sample to throw on a streak plate. Um, but you could potentially, I guess, pulverize it and get the same. You get the, the color that way, but I'm not going to. I don't. I really don't have very much muscovite. As, as, as odd as, as that is, as common as that is, it's a... Uh, it's a colorless in, in thin section mineral. And, okay, that's right. It's not very, very easily altered, um, but it can weather to clay minerals over time. Um, and I haven't seen that as common as, as the as feldspars and um, other silicates. Typically, in my experience, when I've seen muscovite in plastic settings and basements like I've worked in, they, they, they form what's called a pseudo, um, pseudo matrix. They, they, they kind of deform because they bend, they're flexible. So the little, little pieces of muscovite actually bend in and around the grains. And then in the sedimentary world, we call that pseudo matrix. It's not actual matrix. It's not like the other little grains that fill all the pore spaces. It just, it's, it's a very different and in its own category. It's very strange. And I can show you that as well when we go over the, um, kaolinite pictures, um, coming up soon. I would think so. I just don't know which rocks. Probably more like clays, sediment, not rocks. I'm not sure. I mean, plants and things can grow on them. Like, I mean, lichen, so I don't see why not. So in igneous rocks, muscovite occurs in granitic pegmatites, granite, granodiorite, and other related igneous rocks that are typically felsic in nature. Felsic being they have a lot more um, silica, well, silicates, but less iron and magnesium than other rocks. So a lot of the minerals that are going to be in felsic rocks are going to have a lot less magnesium and iron. Muscovite is one of those. Biotite, on the other hand, has lots of magnesium and iron. It's a different mica, but it does. In metamorphic minerals, um, micas occur in all sorts of things. So slate, phyllite, schist, gneiss, hornfels, quartzite, um, which makes sense because all of those basically come from different types of uh, granitic rocks, essentially. Um, Quartzite is mostly, well, that's a sedimentary, um, but it's still very, very quartz and feldspar and muscovite rich, regardless. And again, classic sediments like I've studied often contain muscovite, 
Uh, it's not subjected to lots of weathering. It does get altered and it can be deformed, but it doesn't get really weathered out like a lot of uh, other things can. And again, it's because it's it's made of things that are much more stable at surficial conditions. It's one of the last things in a body of magma to form. So because it forms at a lower temperature, it's therefore stable at lower temperatures. Whereas things that form at really high temperatures like olivine aren't going to be as stable and they'll weather out of the environment much more quickly. Back to the uses of muscovite. Again, like I mentioned, this can be substitute for glass, but it is very seldomly done so anymore. Uh, it's used widely in electronics, in industrial uses and consumer products. The electronics it's used in are capacitors, transistors, insulators, and microwave tubes. Specifically, the tubes in the glass of the microwave. I don't know what they look like, besides being tubes. But they are they they make little tubes, and then they are, they use them in the I guess screen or glass of the microwave. Um, as for industrial applications, plastic filler, paint, um, uh, wallboard cement. Oh, the silky luster on wallpaper is sometimes used from uh, muscovite. Uh, it's a constituent in drilling mud, just like a lot of the clays are too. Kaolinite's another constituent in, in drilling mud as well. We'll talk about that another day. Um, and then the consumer products, of course, it's, in, it's included in is nail polish, lipstick, eyeshadow, and basically anything that's a cosmetic cream with a shimmer. Lots of glitter, lots of muscovite, makes things shiny. Okay? So... These are some varieties of muscovite. The ones that I have, however, are a little bit different. And I'll show you. So these are these are the varieties that I have. So this is, again, these just plain sample of muscovite that I have in a, a basic rock kit. This is actually a feldspar here. It's a piece of amazonite with uh, muscovite on it. So you see how very different the, the coloration can be. And I mean, it's a little bit more brown and there could be some trace elements in there making it slightly more brown, but most likely it's just that it's a lot thicker and it's on a, on another piece of a rock. So the light isn't penetrating it as, as easily as it would a thinner piece. And this is a, a different variety called Fuchsite. This variety I actually um, is from Brazil. I don't know where my other samples are from. The Amazonite is from... I don't remember. I may, I may not have a location for the Amazonite. Let's look at, let's look at, I'm going to look at a couple of these with a microscope camera. There you are. All right. This is the muscovite. Whew. This is the muscovite on, um, on Amazonite that I have. So this is actually a piece of a rock, but it looks cool. I can't wait to show you in thin section what it looks like. And not in thin section, but in, uh, well, I actually do have some in thin section. I'll try to find some pictures of thin section muscovite and um, uh, and SEM muscovite images. The SEM images of muscovite and biotite look pretty similar, but there's a lot more biotite in my samples than there was muscovite. I just wanted to see inside of it if you could see any of those little booklets yeah you can see them a little bit yeah you could see where you could peel one off there's some little layers you could easily just pull right off I kind of want to pull one off and show you there so there's a sheet right here. I don't know if you can see it coming off. All right, I'm going to I'm going to do it. So this here it comes right off in a little sheet. See? Isn't that so small? Isn't that so cute? It's a little small, small mineral. Pretty small. Now I'm going to look at it next to this guy. See? They're much more similarly colored now that they're thinner. It is a bit browner, though. I'm 
but it's easy to pull, peel right off. I'm not abusing the minerals. I'm just showing the examples for science. It's fine. Shush. Here's the little piece that I pulled off. He's a little guy. But that's one, that's a, that's a cleavage face right there. So, um, I just, I just pulled off a little plane of cleavage. Well, a couple, because there's probably multiple booklets. You see that? Little Muscovite, come here. Oh my goodness. See, it's so thin. It's so thin. And then here's the fuchsite. So you can just see a bunch of tiny little flakes kind of all adhered together, kind of a mess, but it's pretty, it's a pretty mess. So this is the chromium variety of muscovite. I don't know what this brown stuff is. Maybe it's a, but I like it. It's cool. Chromium for your health. I'll turn this off. So I don't forget to. Muscovite, it's great for actually a lot of industrial uses, okay? And I get it. It's Hyanite was the one that I went with. Um, it also has really good uses. I think that, uh, honestly, uh, I hate to admit it, but I, I think that, that Muscovite probably is more useful. But it depends on, I don't know, all of the uses based on the list that I have. Seems like it has a little more uses, but I think Hyanite's so cooler. Science, it's cooler. It's it's just cooler, so therefore.